everybody, this is Chad. Uh, today I just want to talk really briefly about overflows and sumps. When I first started using a sump, I was uh, I was worried, and, I, and a lot of people get worried because, in essence, what you're doing is you're taking water out of your tank, and you're putting it in another tank, and then you're pumping it back into your tank. And the whole notion of uh, what happens if you're if your drain plugs up, and, or the notion of what happens if your pumps stop pumping. Because if your drains are still flowing, and your pumps aren't pumping, then if it's not done right, you could have catastrophic results. Flooding, very bad. Uh, and an empty tank, with all that water on your floor and your corals and dry land. So, but the, the, fortunately, the, the principles um, to accomplish it are so very simple. Now in my tank I have two overflows, one on each end. So the water drains into each overflow and the way I have it plumbed is that a drain comes down from one and then connects into the other. So going into my sump, there's actually just one drain. So you can see right there they connect up. So that drain comes all the way from over there, and that one from there, and it connects up. I have the ball valve on it in case I need to stop the drain uh, from draining, and that is something that I actually do need to do from time to time in order to clean out the overflow. If I were to turn off my pumps and then remove the standpipes in the overflow, all that water would come down into this sump and obviously fill it and, and overflow it because there's, you know, there's five or ten gallons in each of my overflows and the, there's not enough capacity in this sump to take that extra water. So I, in, no, in that case I could turn the valve, do the work I needed to, and none, none of the water would drain out. So in a regular situation right now the water is draining and the pumps, and in my case I have two pumps. Um, you don't need two pumps, you can do just one. I, I did it this way for a particular reason that is not even worth going into, but um, I have the two pumps. One goes to each return you can easily do this with just one pump. The idea with the pump is to have it be able to pump as much water as uh, you can given the uh, speed of your drain. So if you have an overflow that has a drain that can drain say 600 gallons per hour, you want to have a pump that can return around that. Um, so, uh, you know, I say it, it's okay to go a little under, obviously. You don't want to overwhelm your drain. Um, you know, if you have a pump that's pumping way too much, you know, pumping faster than the drain will drain, then your sump will go dry. Um, so you can have a drain that drains at 600 gallons per hour, but you only be putting 500 through it. So the way we decide what pump to use we start with knowing um, two things. We start with knowing what our drain can handle. And we'll just say that 600 gallons per hour. That's common for many tanks. Um, so say it's 600 gallons per hour. So I go buy a pump. And the second thing you need to know is the height at which it will pump. So you can see from my tank, uh, not only does it pump from there up to there, but that continues all there. So we're talking five feet that it has to pump. So on on the usually the back of each pump it will have a chart that tells you how much it pumps at zero and how much it pumps at certain heights. There's going to be a difference. A pump that pumps 1400 gallons per hour at zero feet off the ground we may only pump 600 at four feet off the ground. The difference is what we call head loss. So my pumps, uh, they are 1,400 ga gallons per hour each, but they have a, a head loss. So at this height, my drains, which are each capable, I believe it's 600 gallons per hour, um, are, are actually gonna be pumping around 500, so I have about 1,000 gallons per hour 
circulating through. And that's fine. So that's the first thing when you're deciding what pump. You got to know your your height and your uh, drains gallons per hour so that you know that what your head loss is. And once you figure that out, then you can decide which pump to buy pretty easily. So then the other thing to do once you know your pump and you got your plumbing is you got to just set up your your uh, sump. Now I have a sticker on mine right there that says maximum water level. So the reason it says that is because if I were to turn off my pumps, you can see the water is now not being, it's no longer being pumped back into the tank. So all the water is only going into my sump. So the important thing is, is to know how much water is going to drain into the sump and make sure that you have enough room in your sump. By doing this, if my pumps were to fail due to a power outage or whatever, I don't have to worry about any flooding at all because I know that I have enough room in my sump to take the amount of water. This can take a little experimentation on your part to find the exact level, and that's okay. It took me a little while to figure it out. And you play around and you figure out what it is. And so what happens now, there are no pumps, so the water level is dropping. Now, it can only drop to the point where it can no longer drain. So once the water level reaches below uh, the teeth on my overflow, it cannot drain anymore. So you just have to make sure that you have that much room in your sump. And if you have that much room in your sump, then you simply don't have to worry about flooding if your, your pumps go off. So that works out re you know, really excellent. Um, and then the same is true on the opposite end. You want to make sure that there's enough room in your tank that if the, the drain stops, that your tank has enough room in it to hold the extra water that's in your sump. And that way, the pump will continue to pump until it can't pump anymore, and, and then it will, it will pump dry, and you can have a float switch or a valve that turns it off and take some safety precautions there. Um, and, and really, you don't have to take the entire volume of your sump. This depends on how your sump is set up. In my case, I only have to take the volume of the chamber where the pumps themselves are, because that's going to go dry. Once it gets below that level, no more water can get into it, so it's, it's not going to continue to pump because the, wa the water goes over that, the, the, those two baffles. So it's only that area. So really, it ends up not being a whole a, a lot of extra water for me uh, in my tank. And, and so, like I said, there are some safety things that you can do so that your pump doesn't... Because if your pump runs dry, it's going to destroy it, and it can catch fire. Um, so you can use float switches, you know, like, like that, um, to check water level and turn off pumps and things like that in case there's um, a dry, you know, a dry um, area. So anyway, that's just the basics of it. And, and it's funny because when I first started... Um, contemplating doing a sump, and I was researching how to do it, and, and I'd done sumpless, um, I think it was seven, eight years ago was the first time I actually had a tank with a sump, and I did a hang on the back overflow. This is the first tank I've had with a built-in overflow, which I much prefer. Um, but anyway, I had, you know, you're perfectly okay to go sumpless. I did sumpless for a long time, and it worked just great now that I've done a sump. I really like it. It's a place to put your skimmer and whatever else things that you want to do. And, um, Cheeto and have a refugium and reactors, etc., etc. Just you know, many different good uses. You can put your heaters in there. So anyway, um, yeah, I was worried about it, and so I did a, I did a lot of the research to, to figure it out. And so once I got that basic concept that if you set it up right, it's it's impossible to flood your house. If the pump goes bad or a drain gets clogged up, um, then then I, it set my mind at ease. Uh, set up my first tank with a with a sump and a hang on the back overflow. It functioned great. Never had a single problem. Even during power outages, it was exactly like I had anticipated. So it's not something to worry about. Having a sump is well worth uh, 
uh, the effort and the ex you know the extra expense of whatever. You can buy a sump. Uh, as you can see, I took a 20 gallon long tank uh, in this case and, and just went to Lowe's, had them cut baffles for me, and I used a, uh, aquarium silicone to put them in place, and yeah, it works great. So when I turn it back on, so it takes a, a while. Now it's going to be draining the water back out. And it'll drain that water out until it hits back to the top of those drains again, or the overflows, and then it will begin to drain. So you can see right now, that's the drain. Nothing's coming out of it yet, because we're still pumping water into the tank. It hasn't reached the, the drain yet. And so we give, give, you can see now some bubbles are starting. And there we go. It's now draining again. Uh, and it'll hit full speed in just a second as we get close to our, our water level mark. So, in the bubbles, I have a bubble trap here, so the water actually flows under this one, and then up this one and over, and that helps to trap the bubbles, but just to make sure, I put a, a little fitting on the end that throws the bubbles away from it anyway, so that there's even less of a chance. Bubbles don't, don't hurt, uh, they're just really, you know, they're annoying, they can irritate corals and make them close up, uh, so, you know, people don't like them, they're also unattractive. Anyway, that's the basics of a sump uh, right there. The sound you're hearing is my automatic top-off. It decided that it needed a little more water. Um, so that's another good thing about sumps. It's an easy way to top off uh, automatically. And the way I do it is I just drill the hole. See that hole there? It comes right there out of the, out of the uh, tank. And I just put the water bucket right there and then slip that down into it. This piece of PVC has a, a hose and a float valve, so if this goes dry, uh, the pump won't pump. Uh, and it's all one unit, so when I change the bucket, simply take that out, put it in the new bucket, uh, good to go. That's the basics of the sump. You can add a refugium. I have a second tank over there uh, that is my refugium. And you can see i got a bunch of stuff here. Those, those These lead to the refugium and to two reactors that I have. Um, instead of using an extra pump, I bought a, a, a hose bib. So this is a PVC fitting that actually has a hose bib. So my main pump here actually powers uh, the flow in the refugium and the flow through my dual reactors, just as an added measure. Anyway, that's probably uh, a long enough video on this subject. Uh, if you have any questions, leave them in the comments. and. Uh, be happy to answer them. It's really quite easy and very well worth the effort. And you can see I use um, just the uh, vinyl or nylon, I don't know which it's made out of, uh, tubing, uh, which works great. PVC is also good. I use this because I am not much of a plumber, and, and using this flexible hosing is very forgiving um, and quite easy to put together. So if I were better at it, you know, we've, I've talked about this before in my videos, I'm not a do-it-yourself kind of guy. So if I were, this would be beautifully plumbed, and I've seen some tanks that I'm envious of because they're plumbed so professionally with, you know, all sorts of different uh, uh, bowels and going this ways and that ways, and it's just, you know, it's really cool to behold, but for me, uh, I'm just not that good, so I, I went with this flexible. It's also uh, very inexpensive, easy to replace, and, and I kind of like being able to see through it. You know, you can see that things growing in it when it needs cleaned or replaced. Uh, that's it, guys. Um, I'll, thanks for watching. I'll talk to you later. Bye.